Welcome back. You made it. Mr. Lands flipped U.S. History Classroom Video 8. The title is Colonial Government. Write it down. We're moving on. So in today's video, we're getting into something that I love, which is the topic of government. But first, kids, we got to do some of this process skills. Make sure by now you've already been with me on this journey. You know how to listen. You know how to read. You know how to write. But you know you got to pause and rewind. If you miss something, you got to think about it. You got to pause and rewind. Check those questions, students, on your Cornell notes as you go through the lesson, all right? I'm leaving you that those answers. I want you to learn it. I want you to get it. I want it to be easy for you. We're going to focus on two particular words here on our vocabulary list. Let me pronounce those words for you right now. Two of these words are going to be big time. Number one, charter. Number two, compact. Number three, self-government. Number four, Burgess. That's pronounced Burgess. Number five, legislature. Number six, assembly. Number seven, constitution. Pause my face and write them down. Okay, you unfroze me, so you got your vocab. Let's dive in. So the questions, what traditions of government did colonists bring with them to our new world? Can we identify them? Like, can we actually name those influences of government? And also, how the heck did these influences create American government today in 2022? There's a whole trail of government stories that'll help us find out about how government got here in 2022. So the layers of the colonies. Mr. Land's going to add the last layer. So you've watched my video series, you know that the colonies are being built on layers. So right now, that last layer, let me review the layers we've covered. We've covered climate. We've learned geography. We've learned economy about money. We've also learned about religion and people. But last is the government topic, which is so complicated and complex, but so awesomely simple that we can get into so many different ways. That's what we're going to study today. Government creations of systems for leaderships, rights, and decision making. It is a great story. So let's dive in. Kids are going to ask me, sir, what is government? What does it do? Well, by looking at these images, do you see something from our world that reminds you of what government is, what it does, what it's supposed to be? Because these images are all government. Government is defined as a group of elected people that have power to rule or govern. Listen to that word. That's where government comes from. Now, there, do has, there does have to be laws. So government makes laws and enforces laws. That's really important. Laws are for fairness. So who invented American government? Where did our own government come from? Well, there's stories to tell there. We know that the British colonists that left England or Great Britain are bringing their traditions with them. So essentially, our ideas of government are coming from England, from Great Britain. So these colonists are essentially going to influence the future of our 13 colonies. And that's where our government's coming from. So let's begin with the story of the Mayflower Compact. Now, we know the story of the pilgrims. I'm going to use the word Puritans, too, because they were both. So we know that it begins with the Mayflower. Now, the, the, the Puritans were leaving England. The pilgrims were leaving England to look for religious freedom. Now, we know that. Now, the king gave them special permission to seek a charter. That is a permission slip. Now, that, that permission slip allowed them to go to Virginia. I don't know if you knew that yet, but they were the pilgrims were supposed to land in Virginia. Now, unfortunately, about three-fourths of the way, right before getting there, they hit a thunderstorm really bad, and the captain of the ship decides, we can't land in Virginia. So this kind of creates some concern because now the pilgrims are worried that instead of going to Virginia where there was settlements like Jamestown and English people, now they were going to a new land in the new world that was totally independent, meaning no English presence there, no settlement, no colonists, no rules, no laws were there. So they were worried that without those rules and laws and people to enforce them, that there was going to be just pure chaos. This frightened the pilgrims. Now, we know that they land in Plymouth in 1620, and the rest is history. But what about this concern for their laws? Well, the pilgrims, Puritans, they create a document on the ship right before they land in the bottom hold. They, 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 one of the lawyers writes it up, and it's an amazing piece of history. Why? Because they were going to use this document to basically avoid any chaos that they could encounter in the New World. Some of the passengers on the Mayflower were even talking about leaving 
the group entirely once they hit landfall. And this scared the pilgrims because they were worried about the future unsuccess of their colony. So all of the pilgrim males decided to sign the Mayflower Compact. A compact is a document. It's an, it's an agreement, a social contract. This is huge, kids. You got to know this. This is what makes a cornerstone of the future of our government. A social contract is a document that is basically an agreement between the people who sign it. That's what a contract is. But more importantly, look at the word social. Social in this case means a way of life, meaning that if we sign this document as Pilgrims Puritans, we agree for the betterment of all of us, not just one of us, but all of us. We want everyone to feel better, safer, and have less chaos in their lives. Now, this cartoon is silly, but it kind of proves the point. The colonist on the left says, you, you don't kill me and I won't kill you. And the other colonist says, hey, great idea. Now, <laughs> We, won't, we wouldn't want that in the real world. But if people had the right to do whatever they want in a government, do you think that that means bad things too? Couldn't people do bad things if they had the right to do whatever they wanted? It does, doesn't it? So the pilgrims realized this was a problem. So instead of giving every individual every right in the world that they thought they could have, the pilgrims are signing the document. And what they're doing is, they're giving up some of their rights, meaning I won't do everything that I could do, including the bad stuff. And by agreeing to sign the document, I will agree to follow the laws with everyone else. And so this is going to make the group safer, stronger. This is why we have rules and laws in government, kids, so that we can all feel safer about how we can live our lives. And more so, we are agreeing by signing the, the Mayflower Compact that we will be ruled. The pilgrims are saying we will allow a leader to rule us by giving up some of our rights. That is an American idea right there because that is precisely what our government is built upon. The idea that we can stay protected, stay out of chaos and follow laws for the betterment of all of us, including you kids. So this Mayflower Compact, it brings law and order, right? It also brings an idea forward that we as people can have a self-government, meaning that we ourselves can rule over ourselves. For example, the pilgrim leaders who wrote the document, they accepted that they could rule and govern the pilgrims who signed the compact and they were agreeing to do that. Here is the idea that is coming out of this document, of this social contract. The idea is called consent of the governed. Now let's break this down a little bit, okay? Because this can get a little tricky. Now consent of the governed is the idea on the compact that consent means what? Consent means permission. So permission to rule, okay? Permission to rule the governed. So where, who are the governed? The governed are the people that are being ruled. So the pilgrim signed the document saying, someone, I give permission to rule me, to, to, to lead me. So the people themselves are agreeing to be ruled. Think about that. You are giving someone power over you in government to lead you. It is a very American ideal. So they are giving us this ideal where they show us, give up your power, let someone lead you, and you can be safer because we're all going to be in the same boat together. We're all going to be following the rules, and we're all going to protect each other. Great ideal, American future. Now, the House of Burgers is the next story I want to get to. My favorite, yes, the House of Burgers. You need to look at a burger. I got your taste buds going. Ha, I'm kidding. <laughs> The burgers are not real, kids. I'm so sorry. Did I get your taste buds going? Now, this is actually what I call the House of Burgers in class. It's called the House of Burgesses, and it is located in Virginia. That is the actual house right there. It's an actual house. Now, at this point, a kid's going to ask me, sir, what's, what's a Burgess? Let me throw some Burgesses up there. Here are some actual uh, really good renderings and drawings of what a Burgess might look like in the 1600s. So at this point, what's a Burgess, sir? A Burgess is an elected representative 
to a group of representatives. And it's a man. I'm sorry, girls. There are no, there are no women Burgesses out there during this time period. So a Burgess can also be part of a larger group. And those men, those representatives that come together, we call that an assembly because they get together, okay? So let's look at the House of Burgesses and why it's important. Now, the House of Burgesses is a literal house. So the story goes that in Virginia, the men of the Virginia colony wanted to have more control in the decision-making of their own homes. So the settlements of Virginia were given the right to vote for their representatives. And these representatives would speak on their behalf in the House of Burgesses. So who gave these men the power? Well, England did, because England was the mother country. So these men were chosen by the colonists. So the colonists would vote for them. And these men, we're going to call them the Burgesses. Now, today we call them reps or representatives. They would be the ones that would do all of the work for the people that voted for them. So when I think of a representative, I think of like someone uh, that's that's in Washington, D.C. or in the state capitol. It's someone who's like a politician, a lawmaker. They're, uh, that You might see them on TV and they're out there trying to work for the people like you. So in class, I always use the, the little phrase, got to think of a representative. They got to represent for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because it's cringy to represent. Okay, so the representatives are the Burgesses. So what did they do? Well, the assembly of the representatives would get together and they would do several things that were important for the day. They would make laws. They could also ask for permission to change laws. Not only that, they would try to solve the problems in the community. So people had problems, like the way you see on TV with judges shows, like Judge Judy, and they tried to solve them. So they were trying to keep order and fairness and laws in Virginia every day. So this is the big idea. This assembly of representatives has a name. It's formally called in government. It's called a, see it in red, legislature. That's what we call this group of men. That's what a legislature would look like today in 2022. It's a group of representatives that was elected by who? By you, by the people. So in the 1600s, this was humongous because it was the first time in the history of the new world that the House of Burgesses was created as a legislature. It was a model, an example for others to follow. It had never been done in the history of the New World. There had never been a representative to speak on behalf of the people who voted for him. So the Burgesses are kind of treading new ground here. So you have the colonists, the citizens who would vote for the leader. That was the representative who would speak for them, right? And so by doing this, the voters are showing their power. They're showing that they are the ones that are having the real power in the system because they're voting. So in Virginia, this is creating a new type of government. Do you see the United States with all the faces there? That's a great picture of what this is leading to. This House of Burgesses is creating something called representative government, meaning a government that is represented for the people who vote for them, for them. That is an amazing ideal in American history because we still do that today. We still have a legislature and we still vote for the people who speak for us in government. That is amazing. That's why this story has to be remembered. That's why you gotta learn government people because someday you're gonna vote too. And you wanna vote for people who represent your opinions. Now, the last story I'm gonna get into today is my man, Thomas Hooker. Now, I can't tell you what he looks like because we don't have any pictures of him, but Mr. Hooker influences the first constitution in the new world in his colony of Connecticut. Now, Connecticut was known for being a place of religious freedom, but Mr. Hooker wanted to cut something in Connecticut. Remember from class? What was it that he wanted to cut? Well, he named his document which is called a constitution. He named it the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. I know, it's a long name, I know. Now, a constitution is a word that we know, but what is a constitution? A constitution is a set of rules that a government has to follow. It's for being fair, it's for rightness and justice. 
Now, everywhere we go in life, there are rules. Now, a constitution is a document that tells the government what the rules are. Mr. Hooker invented that first document in the new world, and he named it the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. Now, it's a lot like playing a kid's game. Even when you play games, aren't there rules in games? Aren't there rules in sports? Aren't there rules in video games? You have to follow rules. So a constitution is nothing more than a rule book, a set of rules to follow, but it's in government. So this constitution, Mr. Hooker, he did not like how the Puritans were so strict about their religion. They didn't let anyone vote on any of the matters of the community if they weren't religiously involved. Now, Mr. Hooker didn't like this, and he wanted to see more people be involved in the voting of his community, Colony of Connecticut. So he's basically saying, hey, all I want to make more voting rights, even for the people who are not in church. That's the big disagreement he had with the Puritans. So by doing this, Mr. Hooker is, what is he doing? He is, that document is giving the people more representation. You got that word again, more representative government in the new world. He's giving them more choices. Now in class, we're going to study salutary neglect. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of get to the end questions there. We're going to study this one in class. If you want to pause and watch it, by all means. So can you answer these questions today? Can you describe how the important document of the pilgrims is a social contract? Can you, can you explain what a constitution is? Do you know what a legislature is? If you can answer those questions by the end of this video, you did great. I want to say thanks for being here, and I'm going to see you soon. Peace, everybody.